we go again. This is our fourth of four road trips. We've promised you four points of the compass and we're trying to go south again. A year ago from right now, we set out west and started our trip in San Francisco and drove straight north up the coast all the way to Seattle. That was after I had had an engine rebuilt on and a lot of money poured into the car at that point. Then, almost 10 months ago, we wanted to go to Texas. There was an ice storm that was threatening Austin for the weekend we were supposed to be down there and Redwood got canceled. We just thought, the weather's gonna be that bad. We don't wanna be encouraging other people to get out. We're going home. So we turned our cars straight east and went to Philadelphia for a Radwood show there. And then, not too long ago, we went up to Glacier National Park. We went straight north. I still can't believe I've had this car on three big road trips and we're doing a fourth. Sitting in traffic, it's easy to forget great driving even exists. And commute cars can be boring. So we've gone back to the cars that inspired our show, now considered collector's cars that shouldn't be driven. But we're setting out on four epic road trips, one in each direction of the compass in search of amazing roads and new adventures, the four points in the great cars of the past. It's probably time for a car update. As you noticed when we left the story last time, the Z had had a pretty catastrophic cooling problem. We couldn't find the source of it. I'd actually run this car as an air-cooled car for a tiny bit of time. I don't recommend that, by the way. But when we put coolant back in it, it held, and we didn't know what the problem was. I had my mechanic do a full test on this coolant system, a big pressure test to see how it held up. And for a long time, it was fine, no leaks. When they got to a lot of pressure differential, then it started to have a seeping leak out of one of the corners of the radiator which made some sense because I wasn't having any leak problems until we got to extremely high altitude, above 10,000 feet, and then I promptly lost all of my coolant over time. So I put a brand new radiator in this car from Z1 Motorsports, got all new check of all of the hoses and the connections in the radiator system, and now it actually is running great. Granted, it's 25 degrees right now, so running hot was not my concern, but having this car run properly with no coolant issues was paramount for this trip. At the beginning of the last trip, trip number three, it started out great mechanically speaking. The car had had a lot of work done to it and it was running great. But by the end of the trip, I discovered a judder in the driveline and I was very concerned about the driveline. I didn't know what it was. Well, as it turns out, the cat was clogged. Good news, I have now replaced the cast iron headers. Those are gone. I put MSDS headers on. The catalytic converter is gone. It's just a V pipe with a new oxygen sensor bolted in. And I have newfound power. It's free breathing. It's the automotive equivalent of going commando. I've got a 928 Outlaw here. You'll also notice that I've gone back to the 17 inch Cup 2 wheels. And that's because I got different shocks last time around and I was having trouble by the end of the trip turning the front wheels because the shocks had settled and these wheels and tires just fit better on the car. I think they look better too. So I got a ride height adjustment and I could turn the car again. And we're trying once more now to go south through Utah, through New Mexico. Of the four trips, this is the one where we have the lowest expectation for the quality of the roads. This trip will probably have a lot of moments like this, where we're just getting miles done on a freeway. Now, we're still gonna do everything we can to take back roads. We're not gonna be on the major interstate very much. If we do what we're hoping to, we're gonna do a great road in Texas that I've never even been on, but I've heard is one of the better roads in the country, in Texas of all places. After we do that, we're also going to go all the way to Austin and hopefully get these cars on Circuit of the Americas. We don't know yet, we're trying, that's the intention. I'm so glad we're doing this with these two cars. And you know, Todd has made noises. I think he's probably going to get rid of the Z after this trip. He's had his time with it. But I think it was a response to me getting this car. I got this car not thinking it would ever leave my life again. I put so much time and effort and money and sweat and tears and interventions from friends into this car. This is going nowhere. I've also realized it's been a long time since I've driven Paul's 928. He's done so much stuff to it since the last time I drove it. It should actually be significantly better. All of a sudden, he's just happy. 
and thundering around the corners, and I'm, you know, enjoying keeping up, but that was not the Paul that's been in corners prior. I didn't let Todd drive this last trip. We didn't swap cars. I wasn't feeling too proud of it, but now it's so good. We're gonna swap cars again, and there's three things I want you to look for. Newfound power is the first one, the different sound, and the ride quality. Okay, so no pressure, but I am back in Paul's car after a new round of instruction because, well, it's just, it's just not get in and drive it. Dog leg first is one of the things to remember. That's an important key reality. It has been a while since I've been in the Z. The clutch engages so close to the floor. That's crazy. Dog leg first. Second, positive, yay, all right, good. This is so much quieter. <laughs> Just be cool with the shifter. Yeah, the bushings on this shifter are worn as well. The concern now is the transmission. It's, it's just difficult. But once you're in fifth, this is so rock solid. Long live the Z car. This, ah, oh, it's so good. I have no idea how fast I'm going. That's the gauge that is delinquent. Everything else, working. That one, dead. So I'm just guessing. Paul had told me that since the last time I drove this, that the engine has become a lot more eager. This doesn't have the stumbling that it used to have below about 4,000 RPM. And I have to give it to him. This feels ready to go now. It feels much stronger and happier to just run than it ever has. Okay, my car has power. I think it's almost factory power now. It just doesn't have the instantaneous nature of the turbo. That is fun. The other weird thing is, I can tell how fast I'm going. <laughs> he can't. I'm wondering how he's dealing with that. This is also the first time I've been in this car since he put the new Bilsteins on it, the new suspension, and it is glassy in here. This is ready to do the whole nation. This rides like a brand new Grand Touring car, except everything around you is not brand new. I actually think, don't tell Paul, this rides better than the Z does now. Todd is so comfortable over here when he's driving, and it's quiet and it's just great. It's such a great place to be. It's funny that I do fit better in the Z though. I've got more headroom for one thing. I'm, I'm touching all the time. That is down all the way. This is, this is what it does right here. This is exactly how it is. I can tell this car just wants to run. I'm resisting every urge not to put my foot flat to the floor. And this car is heavier than the 928, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels lighter all the time. We've got a passing lane coming up. Dare I downshift? Dare I? Should I? Okay, hang on, hang on. Can I get to fourth from fifth? Successful downshift in the 928. It's just, you alert it that the shift is coming. You begin the shift. You stop halfway through. You consider the shift. You discuss the shift with the car. You complete the shift. Then you ease the clutch out as if you're just easing your way backing out of the room. Then the shifts happen. The biggest Achilles heel clearly now with both of our cars is the transmission. The bushings on the, on the Z are worn. You can tell, you gotta be really careful shifting this car. You cannot slam shift this thing, not that you'd want to. Poor Paul has been just milking this car. He's just, no, actually that's not fair. This car has been milking his wallet. That's actually the better way to put it. He stopped telling me the number. That's how bad the numbers have gotten. The only bright spot of that amount of money is that it is getting noticeably better over time. All right, passing lane half a mile. I wonder if Todd will put it down. I'll have no problem keeping up with him. Got over 100 more horsepower than he does, but still. All right, pull over. I believe in you. Here we go. To the floor. All right. Had the briefest moment of stumble, and then it just took off. That's good. That was a good pass, strong pass definitely feels more powerful than the last time I drove it. Now, it isn't a turbo car still. It isn't some 400 horsepower monster, but it does have a satisfying amount of power. And that's easily triple digits. That's a daily triple right there with zero effort in the Z car. I feel like subsequent generations of the Z car are missing the character, the feeling that this has. And that's because every bit of the car is analog. I really like the Z. 
This is kind of like driving a quick, comfortable lounge chair. I mean, I, I do. I wish I had more headroom. That, that's annoying, but that's just me. That's not the average person. These seats are surprisingly comfortable. The driving position is pretty good, except for the headroom for me. And it's not struggling to do anything you ask. It's just like, sure, let's just do another few hundred miles. Why not? If a new car came out today, brand new, and it had driving dynamics like the Z car, it would be hailed as an amazing new sports car, a great sports car to drive. The dynamics of this hold up to new cars, which is amazing to me. I think that the 928 now is at the road trip capable level that the Z was when we started four trips ago. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but I think this actually, I could totally see doing our road trips in this car now at the stage it's at. I mean, the transmission's frustrating, but you can get around that. You can just accept that as a reality of it and keep moving. Everything else, the ride, the power delivery, the comfort level, the fact that it has air conditioning, suggests, you know what we should do? We should do a series of road trips. I mean, I know we're, we're done, but we should do a series of road trips in the 928. Doing all the stuff that I've done to my car to make it better now tells me that the Z still wins, but still, both of these cars have gotten better with every road trip. You'd think it'd be the opposite. They drive really great. In the Z, 80 is over 3,000 RPM in fifth. I'm doing roughly that, I mean, I don't really know, in the 928 right now, and I'm just over 2,000 RPM. He probably gets better gas mileage than I do. I mean, he has no odometer, so he's not measuring, but you know. Todd's got a great car. It's amazing. I still want my 928, and that's why I'm crazy. And I still like the driving dynamics of the Z car better. I'm really not sure what's wrong with me, but I love the styling of the 928 far more, and it's a Porsche. I, I love how that feels. Sounds good. How about up into fourth? Fourth. Got it, yes, fourth. Okay, I'm gonna have to do lots of downshifting though. Uh, yeah, and I can't be in a gear when I come to a stop, otherwise the transmission freezes. So why don't I get out of gear now? Yeah, okay, out, that's out. I'm just gonna coast. I'm just gonna give it a break. Yeah. Okay, first. Still dog-legging, that's good. Okay. A lot of unnecessary stress in shifting this car. That is still going on, but what you're working with beyond the transmission is starting to feel really well sorted. Let's see what the transmission costs. I am horrified at the thought. Horrified. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Griot's Garage. Use the code EDRIVER for 10% off your order. But we swap back, we're back in our own cars. And I love the Z, it drives so well. But I get back in this and I'm reminded every time that all the work that I put into this and how it's taking me across the country. I like Paul's car a lot, but it's fun to get back in your own and be like, yeah, that's right. And this is right. Like the 928, this has quite a bit of wind noise, but I enjoy the seating position and I just, I like being here so much. Okay, that's new, a little squeaky window there. And that's just the seal. Oh, fun. Excellent. There we go. Okay. We're rolling into the Moab, Utah area now, which is right by Arches National Park. In fact, the opening of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade looks like this area because uh, this is where it was filmed. I'm glad we're seeing the mountains now because everybody tells me how flat Texas is. Everybody's like, Texas is so flat and boring to drive. I'm like, Great, I'm gonna go do that. We're having that experience I love again, just finding a great road. We're just south of Moab, heading south toward Four Corners. Wilson Arch is where we are. Again, this is not part of Arches National Park. It's not one you come to see and yet gorgeous. Any other state in the union, you'd be like, yes, please. 
When I was growing up in Colorado, everybody always talked about Four Corners, and I want to see it. I know it's not the biggest deal ever, but there's something to it. It's just, it's a point way out in the middle of nowhere, all by itself. Fun fact, Four Corners is not actually at Four Corners. The original survey that was done in the 1800s was done a little bit wrong, and it's actually like 1,800 feet away from where the actual Four Corners are. So what they decided to do was just designate that even though it's wrong, that's where the Four Corners are now. So it's right after the fact. I think what gets me the most when we're in places like this is how small we are and how eternal this is. And the fact that it'll be here long after we're gone, it's just, it trips me out. Yeah, uh, we just ran out of road next to Four Corners Monument. They're working on it. It clearly is build time. I mean, this is what I recommend for your sports car fun. Don't actually turn it into a safari build. Just go on a summer road trip down back roads and you'll accidentally make it safari. So it's perfect conditions. It's no pavement and the sun's right in my eyes. Perfect. Is this it? Just in time. We've got 30 minutes before the park closes. We did it. state chase. It is, it's a multi-state chase. <laughs> this chase was seen through four states. <laughs> this is how you travel to lots of states without going very far. It's, it's, it's like a multi-state game of twister. It is, but you're, do, you're doing a phenomenal <laughs> job. So, on to Shiprock before we spend the night in Albuquerque. This place intrigues me. And right over the next rise is the monument. We need some sort of angelic vo voices oh, for Shiprock. I'm going to be disappointed, aren't I? There it is. The light's still on it. Wow. Paul mentioned in passing when we were planning this trip, oh, are we going to be close to Shiprock? And I said, what now? And here we are. We're seeing it, which is cool. Leaving Albuquerque this morning, I feel like Todd and I are spaceships in traffic. Today, the transmission is acting up. Well, it actually kind of started last night. It's really difficult to get it out of gear into neutral. So I'm having to be very deliberate and careful with every shift. But everybody behind me just doesn't seem to understand. Impatient, lining up, not understanding why my car isn't just a toaster moving with traffic. And I'm okay with that. Last night at dinner, Paul was having a lot of difficulty with the 928. Into gear was one thing, but out of any gear was becoming near impossible. The transmission just needs a lot of ongoing conversation. And now, apparently, it's a contentious conversation, bordering on an argument. And I'm hoping it gets me all the way through. I'm just having a baby it. I'm double and triple clutching everywhere, up and down. But the engine is rock solid. It makes more power than it ever has. And I can just pull in any gear, and it's great. We've got a lot to see today, because we have to stop in Roswell, New Mexico. That is Alien Central in the US, tiny little town that is known only for first alien contact. Today is Alien Day. It's Alien Keychain Day. I want an alien head on a keychain. That is the goal for today. I don't care where it comes from, that's what I want. I have to add to the collection today. We found another famous place that relates to space just south of Albuquerque, and that is the Very Large Array, which is a very stupid name. I love that we're going out of our way to go find stuff. There's so much space out here. I mean, there's that's been the theme for most of our road trips. It's just wide open spaces and stuff that goes in them. I mean, there's, there's enough room out here to put one of those giant radio telescopes out here to talk to aliens or 
maybe even you know listen for aliens you would not go to the very large array by accident you wouldn't just stumble upon it and be like oh i wonder what that is you have to make the effort how crazy is this what i don't know why i'm intrigued but that is cool you may think, why go to the very large array? Well, because it's something you've probably seen. It was part of the sci-fi film, Contact. If you listen close, I think you can hear Paul in the 928. If you can hear me, I am okay to go. I'm okay to go. So here we are in the absolute middle of nowhere, New Mexico, at the aptly named Very Large Array. As featured in contact, there it is. Is it very large though? Is it very large? It's an array, certainly. It's sort of like a medium sized array at this point. And I was expecting the dishes to be bigger, like the Rose Bowl. Like, come on, why was there a budget cut? Why aren't they bigger? If they had only been bigger, we could have heard more from outer space. This seems like, you know, kind of a half-hearted effort here, people. We just left Socorro, New Mexico, which is the closest city of any consequence to the very large array. So, of course, that's where we're listening for little green men and other things. Now we're on a straight as an arrow piece of blacktop that is headed eventually to Roswell, New Mexico, where the first alien crash happened. And along the way, we're passing White Sands Missile Testing Area, so that means most of this area at some point has been blown up. Okay, White Sands Missile Range, Stallion Range Center, half a mile to the south. Look at that. I see a ray dome on top of that hill over there. What a great place to blow up dirt. Look, a structure still standing. And there's a sign that says this stretch of road is subject to closure due to missile firing. That doesn't make me feel too good. And then, as it turns out, this is a close spot to the original test site for the Manhattan Project. The thing where they set off the first atomic bomb and thought, well, either we're all gonna die or it's gonna work. Here, put on these dark goggles, it'll be fine. This is that desolate area where destruction was born. I, I hate to say it that way, but it was out here in the middle of this nothingness. We're gonna blow stuff up. I mean, big time. You know, I was having this thought, Todd, that you could pretty much blow up this area about a thousand times with nuclear weapons and it wouldn't really look any different. Take a little bit of time for the scrub brush to grow back and then it'll look like this. I mean, this whole area might have been blown up already, but it just kind of looks the same as everywhere else around here. Can you imagine living out here on this ranch? Can you imagine? Like, that is somebody's home. That is a ranch. Do they call you when they're going to fire missiles? They say, you should probably close the curtains for this one. It's going to be a bright day. I mean, those that trailer out there looks like one of those trailers in the test films, you know, when things are just decimated. It looks like it's waiting to be blown up. But one of the things I do love about these road trips that is, is informing me as we do them is the sense of discovery that it has encouraged in us. We're seeing things that are brand new to us. We're investigating places we wouldn't have had a reason to go to otherwise. And I feel that growing my awareness. I feel it making me more open to new things. And I hope if you're in a place where all you do is the same, that you'll break out and have an adventure, have a discovery, because I just think it's healthy. I think it, it broadens our minds. Belief can get so insular that we refuse to look around. I hope we all believe something new. I hope we all challenge what we believe. Not because I want us to throw out everything that's dear to us, but because everything is worth the challenge. Everything is worth the adventure. Something about driving through New Mexico headed for alien conspiracies makes me pontificate. I don't know why, but I'm just thinking about the broader reality of this huge country that we live in and all the stuff there is to see. We've done a lot of road trips and I, all it's made me aware of is all the stuff we haven't seen yet. So I'm hoping 
there are many more road trips in our future because there's a lot more stuff to see. Well, it's midday. We are cruising now. We're headed to Roswell, New Mexico. And I'm thinking of all the places on the planet, of all the land masses that aliens could choose to land, why there? If aliens are going to come to Earth, New York City, every time. It's always New York City. It's not Roswell. It's not this piece of land out here. In 1947, there was a crash in a farmer's property outside of the town of Roswell. And the Roswell Army Air Corps went out, investigated it. And it first said, officially, we have found a flying disc, which made everybody in the world go, wait a minute, you did a what now? And then the Army quickly retracted that statement. Said, no, 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 that's not what we said. That's not what we said. It's a, it's a weather balloon. The conspiracy theorists, many years later, as late as the 1970s, decided to latch onto this and make it a legend that essentially what did crash in that farmer's field in 1947 was actually an alien spacecraft, and there were actually alien bodies, and all of that got covered up. It was all shipped off from Roswell to Area 51 in Nevada, which is where they've been kept ever since. Have you seen the movie Independence Day? Yeah, that, that kind of connects the dots on this in a dramatic way. Boy, the road surface is sure smooth and glassy. Man, is this a comfortable ride. Glad I got my shocks done. Pass with care. It's straight. There's, look at that, almost to the horizon, till the mountains start. You never see the signs that say pass with abandon. You could pass with abandon. You could pass with your eyes closed. Well, maybe not that, but still. Look at that. I want to push the pedal down as far as it can go. You know, in a strange way, not having a speedometer is very freeing. I don't know how fast I'm going. And I don't care, especially out here. You can't really let him lead because he either drives too slow for the speed limit because he has no idea and there's traffic around him and he's just trying to guess, or he drives so fast he eventually walks away because he doesn't understand if there's nobody in front of him why he just can't keep going quicker. Anybody from a place where the speed limits are both restrictive and seriously enforced, or anybody from a place that is very compact where you just frankly need to go slow, when you're out here, you're gonna feel differently about the speeds that you're driving because there's just nothing but miles to cover. I cannot imagine going through this part of the country on foot or by wagon. You would just feel like it's never going to end because it feels that way at a high speed. I'm boggled by the expanses we have in the American West. But here we are on Highway 70. We are 38 miles from Roswell, and this is glass. It's so interesting because this car was made for roads like this in Germany. It was built for glass smooth pavement. But some of the roads back here in New Mexico are just awful. It doesn't like it at all. I mean, the car is, it gets very uncomfortable. It's kind of surprising. Very much a tool for the job. And when it shines, it's awesome. It's almost unbeatable. But that's about 25% of the time, maybe 30. Today's been the first day we've really kind of been bit by some of the roads. Now we're back to one here that's kind of quick. It's 4.30 near Roswell, New Mexico right now, and it's almost dark, and I don't know that we're gonna make the museum. What we're gonna do is we're gonna find Little Green Men, because that's what Roswell is known for. This appears to be Roswell. We're just coming into the city limits. There it is. Welcome to Roswell, the dairy capital of the Southwest? Is that what it said? Dairy? Okay. Did you say the dairy capital of the Southwest? I think so. Good to know. Are we milking aliens? What's going on? <laughs> what kind of milk is that? And for an alien town, there's no aliens, which has probably been the case since 1947. No aliens. I mean, maybe I just haven't gotten to the wonder yet. Uh, you know, I will, I will hang on to be excitable. Yes. We did it. 
I told you I wanted a little green alien head on a keychain and I got it. But I didn't want it from just anywhere, any shop around here. I wanted it from the UFO Museum. But wait, there's more. Not only did I get that, I got a keychain to the UFO Motel circa 1947. And to ride along with me for the rest of the trip, a little green bendy man. how you're an alien Roswell because uh, City Hall is great. So we've got some driving to still do. We're going to barely get into the edge of Texas this evening which we also lose an hour because we jump a time zone. Tomorrow is a huge day for us trying to get to what's supposed to be one of the best roads in the nation that happens to be hidden away in the Texas Hill Country and I'm quite excited. Cold morning just outside Seminole, Texas, and we are headed down to what's supposed to be a surprisingly great driving road, but right now we are seeing exactly what I remember about growing up in Texas. Flat. Straight. Nothing else. But we've got a long drive, and now that we're in Texas, I get to experience the flat, boring, nothing to look at. Yeah. On the very bright side, though, the gas pump had 93 octane. Yeah. She is feeling good. She's running good when she's all warmed up. We haven't even gotten started yet. And I can't believe how big Texas is. This is insane. It's just, it's just like this. Forever. And pickup trucks. We're getting past, while we do 70 down a back road in Texas by 2,500 level trucks and above, some towing things. This is Texas. They have oil fields to get to, and we are in the way. Let the pickup trucks have all the power. Let the SUVs have all the power. That's fine. And the sports cars, underpowered as they are, they're still more fun. I'm still having more fun in this than any brand new pickup truck. I can't even tell you how many semis and pickups we've seen in the last half hour or hour. That's all there is out here. And the other thing that's shocking is that 95% of those pickups are white or silver. So it's just a sea of sameness in a sea of scrub brush and oil fields. West Texas. One thing that has changed since I grew up in Texas is windmills. West Texas used to be only the oil derricks, and now you actually can see tons and tons of windmills, fields of them out here that are in contrast to the oil. You have the traditional energy consumption and the modern future looking energy consumption side by side, sometimes on the exact same piece of land. It's fascinating to see that. That coexistence, I think, says a lot more about our energy dependence than either one of them as a singular source. Oh look, wait, I think I, yep, I do. I see a curve. Look at this, everyone. A curve. How strange. Wow. I've nicknamed it the Texas Chicane. It's a gradual 90 degree left, followed by a mile's worth of road, followed by a gradual 90 degree right. Of course, the roads aren't great quality. They're, I mean, these are roads that have been used for trucking and they've been used for oil, and so they're not the smoothest roads ever but it's really fun to actually have a sports car and lean them into these corners and just kind of enjoy the fact that we're using the dynamics of these cars and nobody else has this. Granted, that does not stop the guys in pickups from doing 90 around everywhere. So, you know, they're used to being the big dogs and they can't believe that the little guys are here, but hey, we're glad to be here. Texas. Texas. Just kind of hanging out. I will check back in in just a little bit when we're still driving through Texas and it's still flat and it's still high speeds. I bet you that's my prediction.
So we're headed to Twisted Sisters and the northwest corner just to the east of Rock Springs, Texas. We're gonna go explore the hill country. This is really the best roads in Texas. All right, I am 1,412 miles from home, and I'm just turning on the road we came for. The road surface is kind of slowing us down, I feel like. There's a lot of grip, but there's a lot of loose pebbles on top of the asphalt. This road makes its way onto a lot of best motorcycle road lists, and I can actually see that. You get in the car and you fill the lane, and this starts to feel like it needs to be a little bit wider than it is. I actually wouldn't have a problem if the road surface was better, but it's pretty rough, actually. There's no reason to keep these roads up. It would only encourage higher speeds. This is just like paved gullies. It's always scary when you're driving past flood gauges. I don't really have too many of those in Utah. This is not a speed road, it's a flow road. So you can actually do big sections of it with little to no throttle change because you can coast down one hill and back up the other side with a pretty even amount of speed. I'm sure if you did this road over time, you'd figure out the line to link the corners, but so much of this is just an up and down roller coaster motion, much more extreme than the corners themselves. I would imagine that something small and light and not that powerful like a Miata or a GR86 would be incredibly fun on this road. Wow. It's a uh, serious roller coaster here. I think I was expecting something completely different. I mean, I know I was. I was expecting a lot of smooth pavement and much wider roads. This almost feels like a notch above an access road. I wasn't expecting to find a small car road in the middle of Texas where all the roads around it are just bring your Hellcat. On a perfect Texas evening, with the top down in a convertible, this at about 50 miles an hour would be glorious. Okay, getting kind of interesting. That was a super low speed corner. Ah, the road smoothed out, okay. Double apex. Okay, th there's some expanse. There's a little bit of expanse. I see some, there's a bit of a cliff here. That means I think we're doing it right. That's, a, that's more than a gully down there. Yeah, I graduated here to a valley. We might graduate from valley to canyon, but it's right on the cusp. But the road is kinda interesting. It's smoothed out. This is okay. One of the common traits of every one of my favorite roads is that every few miles they change what they're doing. And I will say that Twisted Sisters does that, which is surprising considering the area that it's in. I wouldn't think it would have the opportunity to change very much. Now, where the trees have gotten denser, We've got a more of a roller coaster feel that has higher speeds about it because the road actually even has camber. See that house way back up in there? Here's their gate. They just kind of want to be left alone. Oh, look, genuine longhorns. We did it. That's what I was coming to Texas to see. A real longhorn. Found some. Look at that. There you are. You look burdened by your horns. You really do. Yeah. I'm a longhorn with a long face. My horns are too long. It just hurts. Shouldn't these things be on the front of a Cadillac? Alright, I'm ready for this road to keep surprising me. Having similar ideas to what struck me when we did Hocking Hills, where I really liked it as a locals road. I liked it as a place where if you were in the area, you could come and really enjoy yourself. And this is a lot longer than Hocking Hills. There's a lot of mileage to work with. There's a lot of great corners that you could just hone over time. But in a grand, let's take a road trip to a road. I don't know that it's worth that unless you're already in Texas. Texas is a big state. 
If you're three states over, I, I don't think you should come just for this. Now come for this and for barbecue and for Coda. That sounds like a good trip. Any skepticism I had is gone. Texas actually has twisty roads. This right here actually reminds me a bit of California. This is tight. Look at this canyon. That's tight. Wow. Okay, that's tight. And Twisted Sisters has ended up being a metaphor for Texas in many ways. It is bigger than you think it is. There is more here than you think. Twisted Sisters started off as, okay, I don't know that this quite lives up to the hype, and over time it got better. I am very glad we did this. This is what I was expecting, these roads. And by the way, these dark patches of gray asphalt, they're perfectly smooth. Why not just make the whole road like that? Just finished Twisted Sisters and just looked down to realize I passed 1,500 miles exactly since we left home. That's pretty cool. This is nice. Yeah, this is where these cars shine. These road trips have been strange because we keep discovering things that Americans decide to build in fields and inexplicably, we've found a trend. It plays to the trips we've done before, it plays to the alien concept. People with fields in America just like to fill them with stuff, roadside attractions. So here's another one. What is it about Stonehenge? What is it about a blank field that we must build that in it? Everyday Driver is brought to you by PowerStop. Brake upgrades made easy. There is one place in Texas we have to go to. Everyone tells us, you have to go to Bucky's. Bucky's. So I'm going to Bucky's. It's one of the bigger ones in Bastrop, Texas. It's like you matched a big box store with a gas station and you came up with this monstrosity. Look at the hugeness. It's more than everybody says it is. It's sort of like the viral video of gas stations. It just keeps going. It's unbelievable. You can't take your eyes off it. We came in here for lunch to <laughs> make a joke, and now I can't get him out of here. Have a merry beaver teeth Christmas. You know those little family fun sayings that you see on people's walls? All of them are here. Also, if you've ever wanted a glittering cow skull, they have those here too. It's only $398. You don't have to like the Texas colors. We've got it in black back there. They have it in a nice little turquoise teal. <clears throat> Over there I saw pink. He's like, oh, there's another section? Yes, I promise you there's another section. Yeah. Here we go. Ah, uh -huh. yes. Oh, this is happening. I was hoping for a little beaver, but instead I will settle for a sheriff's badge. All you have to do when you get pulled over in Texas is just show one of these with your license and you should be good. If, you, if you're speeding, you just get right out of your ticket because you've got the official, you know, badge. So they are to be found at Bucky's, so come to Bucky's for your get out of jail free card. Well, this is the last day of our trip. We're in Austin and we were adamant 
that we couldn't come to Austin again without driving our cars on Circuit of the Americas. This is a track that was built in a field for no other purpose than for F1, and that's amazing. And these are not the cars to really drive and get after it on Coda. But I don't care if I get passed by everyone. I have no idea how this car is gonna do. I am pretty anxious, I'll be honest. I wanna have this car on track. I also want to get home. I want the transmission to just at least get me home. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Ah. Sorry. Come on, there we go. Couldn't get it out of first. Yeah, the transmission's acting up. Okay. This is insane. Look how far back I have to lean just to fit the top of my helmet in here. I mean, I barely fit in here as it is without a helmet. This car on Coda is absurd. I'm babying the transmission today and everything is just, <laughs> take it easy. This is the reconnaissance lap and I've never been so uncomfortable in a car on track. The seat belt on this car is connected to the door, see? Because it was that era where you had to have the automatic seat belts you had to climb in, remember that? So. I never really thought about that other than that it's kind of quirky and funny until I got on a racetrack and realized it doesn't come back around by my hip enough. It doesn't pull me back into the seat enough. So I feel like I'm open on my left hip because it goes into the door, which was a great solve for the regulations of the time. It's not a great solve for safety when you're driving around a track. It just doesn't feel secure enough. I mean, I'm doing okay, but I'm just, yeah. I'm on Coda in my 300ZX that I drove here from Utah. I'm not complaining, I'm just acknowledging the reality. I've done this track in Sims, which means at most I kinda know the directions the corners go. Hey look, there's where Carlos Sainz spun right there in the 2022 F1 race. I can't <laughs> it's like laying in bed trying to drive a car on track. This is insane, but look. I've got my 928 on track. Yeah, this has body roll like you wouldn't believe. It's crazy. I'm gonna have to do a lot of point buys here. Such a good car. So this morning, in a moment of almost panic, I checked the speed rating of WRG4 tires and was pleased to discover that it's 150 miles an hour. <laughs> because, I am currently working my Nokian all-weather tires on the track. And they've been phenomenal for these road trips because they've handled anything we've needed them to do, and I greatly appreciate that. But I knew that they were not going to be up for track use. A little bit of noise. They're not quiet completely. They're not silent, but they are quiet most of the time. Take some of that 60,000-mile tread wear off them now. Anytime anybody's ever telling me about ABS and keep the traction control on and all that stuff, 1983, just 1983. Laying in bed trying to drive my car. This is absurd and there's no grip in the seats. Whoa, 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 whoa. Brakes aren't made for that. Okay, look at all the runoff here. <laughs> That sounds pretty thunderous. And look at the elevation change here. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I've got the 928 on Coda. And you know what? It's not half bad. It's half bad. It's not all bad though. Starting to get a bit of a feel for this track. This is an interesting track. Oh, hello. Back coming around, nice and controlled. These tires allowed for that, that's nice. And this poor car. I am so impressed with this car. 87,800 miles and 1,700 miles into this road trip is currently on an F1 track in Texas. I love this series so much. I love that we're doing this. 
This car loves going fast though. Easy into the triples. I'm gonna hang out there about 120. But I am actually going faster than I ever thought I would be on Coda in my vintage car. There we go. Yeah. Yes. That is as high as RPM as I've taken it since the rebuild. And she's doing okay. I'm putting faith in my own work, right? Oh yeah, that's fourth. That's some speed, man. I am pleased with that. Okay, brakes are a bit warped. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm still alive. I'm still alive. We're sharing this track day with one of those exotic car experiences, which means that even though we're not fast, we're out here with people that have all levels of driving experience, including never even seen a racetrack before. So I don't feel like I'm ruining anybody's track day but we are having to be aware of the folks behind us in case they catch us and need to pass because anywhere they do have an ability to point it straight and put it down, they're going to want to. I love this back section, this back combination. Look at my hands, single steering angle and all the corners come to you and I just love parts of the track like that. That is by far my favorite thing. doing too bad now that I know the track a little bit better getting some raindrops so we'll just be cool even though it's classic it's old it's got its problems it is still a Porsche yeah yes I'm getting actual speed out of this car. I am going far faster than I ever thought this car would do on Coda. Chase a GT3 now. Things I probably shouldn't even ponder, but it's funny to have a target. This old girl is such a good car. Listen to the tires complain. I'm good for winter driving. Why are you driving me on track? Come on, big girl. I love that turbo. That's all she's got, full throttle. That feels good. The hill definitely helps you brake. It's like track time is good for the car. Weirdly, as fragile as this is, as many miles and as hard as this car has been driven, it likes track time. It wants track time. You know what I feel like? That this car could just go and go and go. All the gauges look good. Fantastic. We really did this. We really went all the way to Circuit of the Americas in these old cars and got them on track legitimately. I hate to let it go. I really do. I hate to let it go, but she's made it. She survived time on Coda after 1,696 miles I'm finishing my time on Coda. I am proud of this car and I'm thrilled we did this. Thank you to Dave and Monica and Varun and others for getting us out here on this track. Many people to thank for having the chance to be on Coda and so worth it, so worth it. Everything you've seen can be explained. Please look right here.
These two cars, the Porsche 928 and the Nissan 300ZX, have been pivotal for us. We started this show because of owning them the first time, and we bought them again in a fit of nostalgia. But once we decided to do big road trips in them, these cars surprised us again. These trips have shown us things we didn't know existed. Amazing scenery and great roads we never expected. It challenged us, it stressed us out, and still given us some of our best moments behind the wheel. They even caused us to dress up and laugh at ourselves. These road trips have been our favorite films we've ever done. And all of you watching have convinced us to never stop making them. Thank you for watching, for laughing, and for being inspired to take your own cars and go. So while this marks the end of the journeys in these cars, there's more trips to come. And whatever we're driving, we hope to see you out there.